has multiple sources for the subject API. They have Kerberos, they've got and a few other a few other systems. Kernel and internal. But the subject ID namespace is still logically one. And I don't have folks in this one and, and the same folks in this one, right? You, the view to, so we have a student those system. sources are, are used for different purposes. Yeah, we have a student those system, those we have a payroll system. Yes. Yes. And they're never gonna And the namespace is logically conflict. one. Yeah. Of you know, the same person living in right. multiple places, so it, it resolves. Right. So if you have something in the middle like uh, a person or uh, some kind of Uber registry, then you would just feed all those into the registry and just point group right back. Kind of, okay, uh, that's good to know. I mean, that wasn't clear to me until now. That, okay, so there's a CN, and that's their name. Okay, and I'm just going to use that for this example as their name in the subject API and their description in the subject API. So, um, in the sources XML, there's an example of how to do this with LDAP, and I just sort of tweaked this. So object class is CMU person. You want me not to double click? Um, object class is CMU person, and GUID is the subject ID. So that's going to be a search subject. We're just going to search by subject ID. Search by subject identifier is object class equals CMU person, and CMU Andrew common name space ID is whatever it was. And then the third way to search in um, the subject API is a freeform search. And you can do this however you want. In this case, GUI, it could be the GUID, it could be the CN, and it could be just a piece of the CN. And I think in this case, it's going to be case insensitive. Um, and then CMU Andrew common namespace ID, and it could be a piece of that too. So you could type SMI, and it'll be all the IDs that have SMI in it. And And this is where I say that the name is the CN and the description is the CN. So once I have that source, <coughs> I can create a group and grouper called uh, test. I've created a folder called test and a um, group called test group. And I just did that with the um, admin UI. So this is what, what you would see after doing the installer. I did a create folder. I already made a test one, so I'll call this one test two. Created a folder. Save and work in new folder. So now I'm at root test two. Then I create a group. I just called this test group. And by default, with the installer, any group that's created um, Publicly, people can see that that group exists. That's what the view privilege is. And they can read the memberships of this group. Um, those were the default, and I think it's not the default anymore, but I'm not sure. It's in the grouper.properties. That was more for demo purposes, so that you could create a bunch of groups and everyone can see them. Um, I personally think that in your institution, the default should not give everyone the ability to read the memberships of every group, and that people should grant that privilege as they want to for those groups. So by default, if someone creates a group, no one will know that it exists. No one will be able to see the memberships. So I'll save that. And then all I did, I went to the light UI. And I went to manage attributes and permissions. And I'm going to view or assign attributes. And basically, the attributes for the LDAP loader are auto-created by grouper. And if not, you might need to set a switch in one of the config files. I think they're auto-created. And um, I went to, um, so here are the different types of attributes you're going to, types of objects you can assign attributes to, group, folder, entity, membership, immediate membership, attribute definition. This is a group attribute, and if I just type LDAP in here, it'll auto-complete auto to find the built-in grouper attribute that means it's a grouper loader LDAP definition. And in this case, I already assigned it. So I assigned it to test, test group, and then if you go to if you Google Grouper Loader LDAP, you'll see this wiki page that explains all the different things that you can assign to a Loader LDAP job. And um, by the way, this is something that only Grouper admins can do. So regular users can't do this. If there's a user that needs, say, um, group loaded from LDAP, they're going to have to coordinate with the um, Grouper administrator. And I think they can delegate that privilege out, but I'm not sure. 
So basically I use this list to see what the minimal things are required to make this demo work. And again, if you look at this example wiki for this um, CMU example, I have a screenshot of that here. So if you wanted to do that yourself, you could copy that. And then I also put it in text quotes. You could copy and paste some of this stuff. This is just an image. Um, but basically, um, I started out saying that the um, loader type, I think these come up in alphabetical order or something. The loader type is LDAP simple. Those are the three types of LDAP loader types you can have. The simple just populates one group. There's the um, uh, LDAP list of groups, I believe, where you can populate multiple groups from one um, filter. And then uh, LDAP group list, sorry. And then LDAP groups from attributes, where you can populate multiple groups with um, a list of people. And that comes from an attribute that the users have. This is just a simple. Um, group. Um, the source that I, uh, sorry, there's one more step, and I didn't put it on the wiki, but I will. Um, in the grouper loader dot properties, you need to define this LDAP. It doesn't come from the same thing that the uh, um, subject API is. So there are a lot of different settings you can set in the uh, grouper-loader.properties. The only thing you need for this example is the URL because there's no user, there's no password, and we don't care about the other stuff. Um, so <laughs> I'll say set this in the grouper-loader.properties. Um, so you could have multiple LDAPs that the grouper loader or the grouper loader can read from. As long as they have different subjects. <laughs> no. The subject API should have should be distinct. The loader can do whatever. Loader's just reading stuff. You could have you could have an LDAP with subject IDs here that overlaps with this one over here and this one over here. When you do your filter, you're just getting a list of people from an LDAP. It doesn't matter if they're distinct from other LDAPs. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that is a little, a little confusing to me. Is you're right, the loader really has nothing to do with the subject sort. I mean, the loader can use any generic LDAP. It doesn't have right. to use something that's been defined in a subject source right. somewhere. Right. That's not immediately clear. Right. Well, yeah. OK, no, that's, this training is now worth your money. <laughs> um, so basically, I, I defined that there, and I defined that with the name person LDAP. And so in this loader job, I have to link up which LDAP source in the grouper-loader.properties this one's using, and so I say person LDAP there. Then um, it needs, it's cron-based, so you tell it how often to run once the loader runs. And in this case, it's going to run at 8 a.m. every morning. Then you have to say what the filter is. And in this case, um, I just found a filter that returns a dozen or so users. So if you take this filter and run it against their LDAP, The stars are here, but they didn't get down here. Star. Star. It's, it's in the 
the code mm -hmm. section, though. Okay, so, not, I don't know. Um, so anyway, that filter returns a dozen entries, right? So I don't want to stress there about that too much besides publishing this example on the internet. Um, so then, uh, what else? I say what the um, subject attribute name is, GUID. Um, so I think there's another setting where you, where you can say you know that this is a subject ID and not an identifier. Otherwise, this is, I think the way I have it now, it's going to go to every single source and look by ID or identifier for whatever this GUID is. You can constrain this down to say that you know that these are only in this one specific source and, um, and that you know this is a subject ID. So if I set this to be CMU person or whatever the sources.xml ID is, it would only look in that one source. And then the subject ID type, I can set that to subject ID. So then it'll only look for subject IDs in that one source. That'll be the quickest loader job. Otherwise, it's going to have to do more queries to figure out what the source is. And where was I? And so that's, and then OU equals person is uh, down from the default um, uh, part of the uh, dit. And that's all I needed to configure that. So then, um, just to see things work, I set this in the log4j properties that I want loader stuff to be on debug mode. And then I run this job. I'm not going to wait till 8 a.m. in the morning. So I want to log into GSH, which is in the bin directory of either the UI or the web service or just unzip the API. And I need to start um, as root, um, find this group called test test group, and then call loader run one job. And basically, all of those commands are, if you Google um, grouper GSH, um, all the commands for grouper GSH are on this wiki. Um, also, it can run just um, ad hoc Java commands too. So anything in the, in the grouper API, you could run from this interactive shell. And in this case, I'm doing loader stuff. So I do, if I do control F loader and go down a little bit, there's a little section that says how to kick off jobs manually from GSH. So basically, I'm just running these three commands. Uh, grouper session, root session, find the group, and then loader run one job. So I do that in this case, and I had debug on, and it found 13 subjects from that filter. <coughs> it says it's going to add them. And someone <coughs> says that twice, that's OK. And um, after that job, it inserted 13 uh, memberships. It deleted zero. And the total membership count for that group is 13. And now if I go to um, that group in Grouper, <coughs> test, test group, manage members. Ah, what did I do? this five seconds ago. You know what? At first I thought I could connect to Hen's directory, and then I found out that was where I went off from here. Then I switched it to the CMU directory, and that worked with the label of the thing in sources XML was still pen directory. So I changed that, so I think I need to bounce Tomcat, or else I totally wedged it. But this example will work if you do it yourself. <laughs> I promise you. So Chris, you said that uh, you can run ad hoc uh, Java commands from the subject API? Uh, no, from GSH. GSH, that's what I meant. So where do I find where all these potential classes and methods are? The, what's the best way to do that? Like Eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's a fair answer. So yeah, because I see a lot of commands which says you know, subject API, get whatever, dot, do something, dot, do something, dot, do something, and then I think, how am I supposed to know that? Um, we've documented a lot of it. I think if there's a common thing you want to do, we should add it to the GSH page. Once we figure it out, just put it on the list. And, yeah, I, I don't know uh, what I want to do, but I, just, I see how <laughs> the things are constructed, and I kind of went, well, um, I know what you know. You know, there's Java Doc out there, there's Eclipse, and you know, if you want to, like, for instance, find the members of a group, 
get a group, go to Eclipse, we'll get the group object, and there's a get members method. Okay. So anyway, so this works. So I restarted Tomcat, and now these people, I don't know who these people are, from CMU, uh, this is their login ID, this is your GUID, their CN, and now they're members of this group. So to show an example, I can delete a bunch of these. If I can click on the checkboxes. Remove selected members. Are you sure? Yes. And now this group has eight members, and I can go back and run this job again. Maybe. I didn't do this five minutes ago, so maybe this doesn't work. And this will see that these six, five people or whatever are in LDAP but are not in um, the group. It's going to add them again. Go back here, refresh. refresh. And now I got 12 again. Can, can you talk about that a little bit about who's authoritative? Because with the grouper loader, in this case, LDAP's authoritative over grouper. So you can manipulate this and grouper all you want. Whatever that loader job runs on the ADM in your case, it's going to undo whatever you did manually with right. UI. But conversely, if I'm provisioning groups with the PSP back to an LDAP, Grouper is authoritative over the LDAP. So if I go in and manually muck around with right. an LDAP, um, Grouper will take over and group will back or take them away. Right. And that's something that, so I'm not, and I, and I haven't actually done the test things. I know it's a setting in one of the XML files that you say, whether or not the PSP is authoritative? I don't know how, so is there a mode where the PSP is not authoritative? I'm not a PSP person, but I, I would think that... Because I know in one XML, it must be PSP services, or one of them says authoritative equals true or false, and I have not had time... If you're, if you're doing real time, it might just do diffs, but once it does its batch, it should calculate what's in one, what's in the other, and it should replace. Okay. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's how it should work. The loader, Whatever the, the LDAP or SQL system of record is, that's the system of record. It's going to overwrite what's in grouper no matter what. You can't, can't have it both ways. Right. So I think, but I think it was the question, though, is, is maybe a deeper one than just the XML settings and that the, the difference between reference groups in grouper that may be loaded via grouper loader, like this is, right? right. So with reference groups, you're not going to be mucking around with them manually in grouper UI. like we, like. we the example Chris showed here was really more just to show you that the, the grouper loader would then, you know, right. if, if, if it's only started out with five, and then you're somehow LDAP ended up with 13, the next time I ran it would add those to grouper, which is the behavior you want. That, that's the institutional institutional reference. Um, the, the groups that would be authoritative within grouper are the composite groups, like the VPN example that we talked about earlier where um, folks would fall in and then fall out of that based on the reference group, but also other ad hoc groups, and Google would provision that and be authoritative for that attribute in LDAP or wherever, or wherever, wherever else it might be. So ad hoc include, exclude, and groups would be authoritative within Grouper. Right. And then that would affect the downstream PSD provision, right? Yes. So what, what happens if you do that? What just accidentally, or, you know, if you did that accidentally, you removed Ben Chibister, and you had created some ad hoc groups inside of Grouper. Is it a soft delete? I mean, will it link those ad hoc groups back up, or do you have to re-add that person to all the ad hoc groups you created? For ad hoc? If you add this group to other groups, is that what you're saying? You well, okay, so say Ben Ben has a whole bunch of uh, roles and, and such that he's been, you know, you're going down the road. Um, person leaves, or maybe maybe the system triggers that this person is gone, but it was a mistake. And you you put them in all these groups. I'm assuming, I guess I'm making a huge assumption that you are actually provisioning some uh, group and role membership in group. So some of that metadata is stored in the group database, right? So, I'll, right. So, yeah, except for like maybe something you get that's just automatic and you know the edge of person, right. primary affiliation, student, they're always going to be in student. Right, your source, but so you get rid of Ben by accident. Then if he gets synced back in when things get fixed, is all the work that was done on his access uh, gone? Okay. 
So, it depends what you mean by gone. If, if, if a subject falls out of a subject source, he doesn't get automatically removed from groups. He's just not resolvable anymore. Okay. So if there's a system that came and did a lookup by identifier, it would say that subject is not in this group because it can't even look it up. If, it's, if, a, if a web service client came in and said, this is the source, this is the subject ID, are they in this group? Even though they're not resolvable, I think it's still in the group members table. It'll tell you that it's in that group. If that user gets added back to the subject source later on, they'll have all the group memberships back. If those groups had, um, in, had composites on them or rules that said, if they're ever not active anymore, remove them from this group, then for composites, if they come back, they'll be back in those groups. For rules, they won't. They're permanently removed and they'll have to come back through the intake process. Okay. Um, you could have a rule, like I said before, that says don't remove them but put an end date a week from now. And if they figure it out in three days and get back in, then that's all good. If it takes them 10 days, then they'll have to come back through the intake process and get back with their roles and groups and stuff. Okay. <coughs> Um, so, any other questions on this example? You should be able to run this yourself once you're on a better network. Okay, I'm going to go to some of my presents and just sort of go through them very quickly. We have 15 minutes, right? Yeah, about 45. presentation, talk about some of the new features of Grouper, um, some of the things that we do at Penn, and um, I'm just, I'm going to go pretty quickly so I can give you just a high level overview of a lot of the stuff, and then I have another presentation too. So version 2.2 is the upcoming release of Grouper, hopefully it'll be here by the end of the calendar year. Um, we're going to have a new UI that'll be a lot easier to use something called services in Grouper, which is a way, Grouper right now, your um, apps are organized, either you have an app folder, or they're organized however you delegated out your folders to the schools and centers in your institution. Um, but when a user comes to Grouper to manage, you know, confluence, they don't know which folder it's in or whatever. And this is a way to tag a folder in Grouper to be a service, and people can go in, and they'll be able to see, oh, I'm an admin of this service, I know where it is. It's in pen colon um, central IT colon AIT colon apps colon confluence. And uh, it'll be a lot easier for them to find. Improved grouper configuration, the config files have overlays so that you can, you don't need a complete config file for each environment. You can just have what changes, you know, these three things are different. The database URL and password is different. Um, a lot of the other stuff is the same. Um, is that so that you can Get rid of the problem about having multiple sources XML. Yes. Uh, API. So sources XML, we really need to convert that to a properties file so we can do the same thing. But you don't have to have multiple grouper properties, grouper hibernate properties, grouper web properties. Source properties. Specific, not yeah. 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 Um, but I think it'd be easy enough to, to have grouper subject API have the ability to read either from a properties file or the XML, and then if you did the properties file way, you could just override one property. Uh, legacy attribute migrations, what I was talking about earlier, where the old group types and attributes uh, will use the new attribute framework. And GID management, um, each group, um, and I think some other objects too, will have a unique integer, and that'll um, fit well if you're going to export your groups to um, Unix GIDs. So Penn and Grouper, we've been using uh, Grouper for five years. We have about 120,000 groups, about 3 million immediate memberships and only 10,000 permission assignments. Um, the parts of Grouper that we use are basically everything except the PSP. The UI, web service, Grouper shell, loader. Um, <coughs> we use LDAP, but we have our own provisioning because we've been doing it. Um, we, we started before the PSP. The Grouper client, um, external users. We have workflow with Quali Rice, Enoch Lite, and it's heavily delegated. We, we basically have a central um, group that maintains Grouper and all the top level folders everyone else deals with and we don't really know exactly what they're doing. It would be a better presentation if I did. Um, you say you use uh, eDoc Lite, so you actually have a, 
like request for people like, may I please join this group? We have a workflow that somebody approves it and that, that happens. And use the quality e doc for that. Right. Um, and the way it was intended was that at the end of the, once the document is final, you either get some group memberships or you get some permission assignments or whatever. And we have that implemented, but it's only used in a few cases, um, mainly um, where the groups come in is someone from this group can approve at this level of the workflow um, or some other integrations. And then at the end, someone from one of the groups has to go and implement the permission in whatever system it is. Um, and sometimes it's even grouper. I don't know why they don't like the feature it automatically does it, but it is there. Um, yeah, so Quality Rice actually has the uh, grouper API built into when you plug that There's in. a connector. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't use any groups in Quality Rice. It all comes externally from the group. So we have basically 20% of a technical person when it's installs or upgrades or big things, you know, that, that'll that increase, obviously. But generally, a technical person one day a week. And then a data analyst, when people come and they say, I need a group that has this, this type of employee in it. And they have to go and figure out if that group exists. If so, they can give access to it or add it to one of the requester's groups where they go and figure out the query against our um, person database, create a loader job for that group, decide whether it's specific for that application or it should go in the um, community section of Grouper and um, and give access to it that way. Um, and then um, basically there's a manager that oversees it, there are sysadmins that run the boxes, there's an LDAP admin that makes sure LDAP is up and stuff like that. And those aren't full-time, but they, it's just part of their job. Um, so one of the examples of how we use Grouper is Qualtrics survey tool, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, but basically, Penn didn't get a site license for it for whatever reason. So each school or center that wants um, to use it, they have to pony up some money, and then only their people get access to it. And so, and they also get a branded site. So when you log in, you see, oh, this is the business school one or whatever. And so it's a shibboleth um, implementation where we have uh, certain groups. So this is the group structure in um, Grouper. Pen, EVP, biz, business services, apps, Qualtrics, that's the folder structure going down. And then all the schools or centers or whatever that are in Qualtrics have a system of record group, which could either be based on uh, um, the org structure for that institution or a, a specific query. And um, then that's added to another group so that people can add one-offs to it. And then our shibboleth knows that um, if it's the Qualtrics SP that's um, authenticating somebody to send um, this an, an entitlement with whatever groups the user's in underneath this folder, and we have that integration. I don't know exactly what they do to make that work, but it's not too hard. Um, and then um, we will delegate privileges to view and change memberships of this overall group to someone in that school or center so that they can add whatever consultants don't come from the query or whatever it is. Any questions on that? I guess I'm just a little bit confused about like your, your group structure, your Qualtrics, BSD, and BSD system or record. Is, that a, is the BSD a composite group of something and something or are those really two different groups that get handled differently? I mean, you're not really using a composite group in that case. Good question. So there are three types of com composite groups. Um, one is intersection, where basically you have to be in both groups to be in the overall group. And that's good for, you have to be an active employee to be in the overall group. One is a minus, and that's good for uh, excludes. If you say, um, you know, they're in this system of record, but we don't want A, B, and C to be in there because we know they just had problems, but for some reason they're still in the system of record, we don't want them in the overall group. That's a minus. And then there's union, which means they could be in either group, which I, which I would assume that would be what you want. No, you space. never use a union. We should remove it from Grouper. Um, <laughs> basically, you can also just add a group as a member of that group. So if I if I go to the VSD group and just make sure that people aren't going to show oh, up. Oh, you're saying that there would be people in that system record, which is a subgroup within right. VSD. Right. Right. Okay. And then 
and then in the top level group, that's where your ad hoc ads. So basically, the, the BSD group, the only member of it is the system of record group. And a system of record group, wouldn't you want to add in individuals as well? I would thought that was the reason for having the two groups. Right. No one's been added additionally, but someone okay. could add additional people to this overall group. So you're in the department, you get in here automatically, but somebody else works with the department, but it's not in the department, so they need right. access to file tricks. So okay, you yeah, I would, have thought about, here. I would have thought you'd have a composite. And you, you're saying don't use union, just make the other group. Never use union, because composites have a certain overhead Okay. Um, that a group is a member of another group don't have, and it's basically the exact same concept. And with composites, you can't add extra people. You just basically say it's this group and this group. Then right. Now you have three groups. You have the group that's the additions, you have the system of record group and the overall group. In this case, right. you only have two groups. The advantage of the of what you're saying, or at least having three groups, you can still do it with members, is when you delegate the um, privileges to add, to um, change memberships or view the memberships of that additions group, right now the person who has privileges on the Qualtrics group could remove the system of record accidentally. Right. Um, if you just give them access to the ads, the ads group, then they can't really mess it up. Right. But in this case, you know, don't do that. If you do that, then you make a mistake. Right, you'll get a, yeah. a Jira ticket. Yeah. But, but if you wanted to do something like a uh, more complicated union minus other stuff, right. you probably, yeah. Then you, te you definitely need a composite for intersection or um, minus, but there's really never a need to use union. Except in the case where you want to have really control permissions. No, because you can you you need three groups for that, but you don't need union. You can still have those two groups as a member of the overall group, but only give privileges to that one. Oh, okay. So you could prevent some two separate. So um, so you should never use union. So in this case, this is a system of record for the business services department. It's just a query. It runs at 8:28. We basically put some random numbers in here in the morning, so they don't all run at the exact same time against our warehouse, and we have a view there that has that query. So another example, um, Penn has a framework that has a lot of apps, and before we had Grouper, we were doing groups, um, but it was stored in that specific app schema, and we wanted to integrate with Grouper, so we basically put some code in there that says, if you have this in the config file of the framework, instead of looking in the local database, look in Grouper, and now one group can be used across the apps. And another thing that we have for every single app in the framework is, um, uh, like let's say we wanted to add a, an admin to all the apps, we couldn't do that without logging into every single app. So Grouper will automatically look, um, or the uh, framework will automatically look in Grouper for admins, and also it'll make sure that any locally added admins that are that are not in the org of the specific org in the, in the IT department, they won't be able to be an admin anymore. So it automatically deprovisions people and it automatically sets people up, um, which is nice. So in this case, the org, we have all our orgs in Grouper. If you're not in 91XX, which is the IT department, um, then uh, even if you're in this fast admins group, it doesn't matter. And uh, there's logic in the code that looks at the local database as well. Another thing we have is Confluence. Um, Confluence actually removed the ability to externalize users and groups based on a job interface. You can only do it with LDAP now. So once we upgrade Confluence, which I think is the summer, we're going to have to write a um, connector that just goes to their database if that'll work. I don't know. They seem to have a users group, a, a users table, a groups table, and a memberships table. So as long as they don't cache that forever or something, it should work. Um, but basically, we have a connector there <coughs> um, that will um, have Confluence read from Grouper and caches stuff. And then we have a um, um, Grouper has a way for uh, what's called a change log consumer to send real-time messages. And so if you add something in Grouper right then, it'll go and clear the cache in Confluence. And, um, and you'll see that change. So in this case, um, you can't create, you can't manage group memberships in Confluence anymore. Um, we did have, have a two-way connector where when you changed uh, memberships in Confluence, it would do a web service call to change it in Grouper. Um, but for whatever reason, that, that wasn't didn't work, or it stopped working. Um, but now you can create a group here under this group's Confluence folder, and um, Confluence will see it and start using it. 
and and we have a lot of I think there's like a hundred groups in Confluence and Jira that are sourced from Grouper. Um, another thing I'll say is um, when we first started this integration, the admin of Confluence would create groups here, but they'd forget to give the Confluence Kerberos principle access to read it, and they'd forget to assign um, other admins of Confluence to be able to edit the group. So other people would go in, they wouldn't see it, Confluence wouldn't see it, and it was a big problem. So we actually put a rule on this folder, Groups Confluence, that says if, um, if a group is ever created here, automatically give the privilege of read to the, it's actually a group of readers and the only member of it is the Kerberos principle for Confluence and Jira, and then also automatically assign the Confluence and Jira admins group to be able to um, read and update memberships or admin the group or whatever it is. So that makes it a lot easier. Right now people just go and create a group, add a member, and it's done. Everyone has their privileges. So we use the Grouper Loader. Grouper Loader is a daemon that periodically syncs external sources with Grouper. We talked about it a lot, obviously. So we sync, um, uh, we have our org chart as permissions. So you can read certain parts of the org chart for certain applications. Um, we have the org chart in groups. We have um, courses in groups. We have all sorts of different um, uh, centrally stored um, groups in our community folder. So. Um, this is basically schools and centers that use Grouper, arts and sciences, engineering, health system, Wharton, law school, med school, library, IT department. I forget. Uh, executive vice president. Uh, Etsy is stuff in uh, <coughs> admins and stuff of Grouper. And then community is um, our centrally stored sourced groups from either our warehouse or our um, Penn Community Database. So whenever, basically we set some up um, from the get-go and then whenever an application needs something, we just add another one. It takes however long it takes to make the query and assign the attributes. So visiting scholar, visiting faculty, UPHS, students, staff, service providers, researchers, etc. And then you go down to any of these and you know there's a whole slew of others. So inside employee, um, we have the org chart <coughs> and, you know, the 2,000 orgs in the university and all their members and then roll-ups into parent orgs and stuff like that, all those so people loader. Chris, this yep. is one of our CIO's pet thieves. Um, did you take your org chart from your HR system? Do you know where it came from? I take it uh, from the warehouse and somebody puts it in the warehouse who I think put it in correctly. I don't know. You don't really care where I don't know. I mean, we had we had a very serious problem with the org chart a couple months ago because I originally set it up so that the uh, each leaf of the org chart made a folder in Grouper, right. and um, so then you could drill down the org chart in Grouper. It was kind of nice. We had that running for four years, and then um, people in the controller or somebody they decided that uh, you know we should we should change the highest level folder to be something else. And then everything was moved. We had, so one morning when the loader ran, 30,000 memberships were deleted and created in a different location. And all the apps were pointing to different ones. And it was, <coughs> it was, it was one of my worst days for a group right now. Um, so then we changed it so that now all the orgs are basically their org. They're all in one. So all the orgs are in one folder. Each org has its own folder. And if, if the parent of this org changes, it's not going to affect this org's name. So you're not, you're not referring to it by its full path in the org structure. You're just referring to it by its extension, basically. Well, we're, we're just struggling with the uh, concept of where we get the org chart from, finance or HR. Yeah. I don't know. Exactly. If they, have, if they put it in your warehouse and you trust that, I don't know. Um, so we have 92 grouper loader jobs at this point, SQL, and we run them daily and sometimes we run them a few times a day. <coughs> um, provisioning the PSP we've talked about, it can work. We don't use that um, because we predated it. 
Um, grouper changelog can send notifications to XMPP, ESB. You can write a custom Java thing. And basically, as things happen in Grouper, um, things will fire out real time. And you can refresh caches, uh, whatever you want to do based on that information. So, so what ESB, I'm having a hard time grasping the ESB connections on this. What, what ESB does this thing actually use? So someone in the UK contributed this part. Whatever ESB they were using it might be Mule or the Apache one. What's the Apache one? Service Mix? Service Mix. I don't know. Well, it yeah, has I, I tried to I was install Service Mix, but I when I got to Service Mix and got to XMPP, they said, we're deprecating this. Don't use it. No, 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 no. The ESB one is, uh, is a web service call. So you're saying, oh, how do I, how do I register that? Like, you're saying that the grouper loader will Send web service calls for events that happen. Send a web service call. I just have to give it. A, where do I think that endpoint? I I, couldn't, I can't find this for life again. Maybe because I'm really poor at reading documentation. So my apologies. So. So basically, so I googled Grouper ESB. Yeah. And then I clicked on Grouper ESB configuration example. And this is in the um, Grouper loader properties where you configure change logs. Okay. <coughs> and the important thing is that the implementation of the change log consumer is the ESB consumer. And that's built into Grouper. You see it in the Grouper okay. path. And then there are some other properties that that's going to read, like a expression language filter. The only one adds or deletes. Okay. Um, this is the publisher that, I don't know if that says what the format of the messages are. This is the URL it's going to go to. Okay, so that's in the Grouper, uh, this Grouper properties file? Okay. Grouper-loader.properties. Grouper loader properties. Okay, I don't know why I missed that. Okay. Um, this isn't that widely used, but I think it is a good example. So it'd be easy to tweak this if you want your messages to look a little different or whatever. Right, so basically it's just going to call a web service I deployed on some other box someplace right. else. Yeah, with a certain I can format. Put it out on, right. on service mix or uh, active queue or whatever. Right. I and then you can do a transformation there and okay. put it into whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. So basically, um, um, so when we do our, our real time integrations, we always do a full refresh every night and then real time. We either add or remove a member to whatever the group is, or if it's not done very often, we'll just say refresh everything if there's a changing group. <coughs> so auditing, um, user audit, like Bill talked about, audits who does what. Point in time auditing will keep track of the state of the, of the group or registry at a certain point in time. So user audit, I could add a group to another group, and the only entry that will be there is MC Heiser added this group to another group. But it doesn't say MC Heiser effectively added these 10 users to this overall group, because it's just auditing basically the actions that people do. The point in time auditing will audit the um, repercussions of those actions. So you can see who was in a group a month ago, or who was in a group over the last six months, or who are all the people that have ever been in this group, or what groups was this person in three months ago. Stuff like that, the point in time can answer for you. I'm not going to give a full overview of how Penn uses Quali, Rice, EDOC Lite, but I'll just give you the whirlwind tour. Um, basically, a few years ago, we wanted to convert a bunch of paper or data access forms to electronic forms. And we wanted to involve Grouper, um, and we wanted some software to do it. So we picked Quali, Rice, EDOC Lite. So this is an example of, of a paper form. And you can see, you know, fill out some personal information so we can automatically fill that out. You have to sign it. Um, depending on what you're getting access for, you know, maybe the financial people, or, or let's see, fill out what ID you want. Um, what org it's about, stuff like that. And then um, your supervisor has to sign it. Your business administrator has to sign it. And you can see all these sort of like conditions here. Only for general ledger access uh, for non-Ben Financials users to certify chart of accounts, the trainer needs to sign it. And only if it's a salary of management or position inventory does human resources have to sign it. And only if this does payroll have to sign it. Um, 
So there's a lot of logic in the workflow of who it's routed to and so forth. Um, but basically, this is uh, an example of some of the forms. Um, I need this data collection. I need that app. I need this ID, stuff like that. So we're going to autofill certain stuff. We've got certain common includes for privacy statements for all the forms. You can fill it out on behalf of someone else if that person is too important or doesn't know how to do it or you want to um, pre-provision them before they start. They have an org chart to pick which different orgs you're getting access to, and that's based on permission, the permission structure and grouper that's fed by the loader. Um, there's actually a, a person picker from grouper um, so that you can pick your supervisor because we don't have a list of that in the database. In a database, um, uh, the requester will get a notification when it's, when it's complete. They can also go in and see where the form is and who, it's, who has it. When you mail things around the university, you're like, I don't know where my form is. It was mailed to this department, and maybe they have it. I don't know. It's lost, you know, whatever. And we also wanted the data administrators to not have to use Java to create the forms. EDOC Lite, you have to do a lot of XML and maybe some HTML and a lot of copy and paste. And we've basically gotten some people who can do SQL to be able to create their own forms and, and manage them. Um, so basically, you know, you can route to members of a group. Um, you can have the person who's filling out the form select a group. For instance, they select which school they're in, and that links to a group in Grouper. And basically, that helps the delegation. Like, let's say someone goes on vacation. You have a group with three people in it. They all get a notification that something's um, ready to be um, approved, and they'll know that this person's on vacation. I'm going to do it now. Or, you know, basically, the first one of them that, that approves it is done. Um, you can route back to a certain node if they filled it out wrong. Um, if multiple people need to approve it at once, um, but they don't depend on each other, it can be sent to all those um, at once in the workflow, and it just waits for all of them to be done. It doesn't have to be sequential. Conditional routing, um, dynamic routing if you enter your supervisor and so forth. So there's a lot of different... So here's, here's an example of how we use Grouper. Initiator fills out the form. It goes to Grouper uh, to get their subject details. The pickers to pick your supervisor or whatever goes to the goes to Grouper. Um, it routes to a group of people, so it goes to Grouper to get who's in those um, groups from Quali Rice. And you can do that n times. And then it's final, and after that, it could add a member to a group or assign permissions. So here's an example of what that looks like, and I redacted a bunch of the personal information, which I don't know if I really needed to at this point, but. Um, you get to it, a bunch of stuff is grayed out about yourself, you don't have to fill that in, it knows who you are, you did the single sign-on, you pick an org of the things you want um, access to, you can add notes to it and submit, and uh, um, there is a movie that shows a demo of this, if you're interested in it. So that uh, picker, that there's like a little applet that you publish? So there's a, uh, it uses the grouper UI. And when you want to use the picker, and you can do this from any app that has rights to do it, um, you, it does a pop-up HTML window. And then it uses JavaScript to call the parent to set something in a field. So it's not an applet. And it, it kind of relies on you having single sign-on, or else that pop-up's going to come up, and they're going to have to log in again and then do it. So external users at Penn, um, we had a problem where we wanted to use uh, Shiblet within Common, and we want to have an app that uses Grouper. And in order to use Grouper, you have to have a subject source. But we don't know all the users of in Common, obviously. Nobody does. Um, so basically, we needed a way to register external users. And we didn't want to do that in our um, identity management system. So we added. Um, a module to Grouper to manage that for you. So basically, Secure Space is sort of like a collaboration application. And unfortunately, um, we signed a, an agreement with Box in the cloud, so we're trying to migrate out of Secure Space. Um, but it was a good example of using external users with, uh, with Grouper. Um, Here's a six-minute movie that I'll show you. Um, here's a, uh, a Where Are You From page. Let's 
play the telephone game. So most people come in from pen, so the where, where you're from has an easy button on top to say I'm a pen user. You log in. This is the um, part of the application that shows which spaces you have access to. So the application goes to Grouper with the Grouper client and says, which groups under this folder is this person a member of? <coughs> and then it can display this page of spaces. <coughs> and then each space has four roles. We call them roles in secure space, they're actually just groups in Grouper. You can be an admin of a space, you could be a normal user of a space, you could have read-only access or write-only access. So here, that's a list of milestones for the project or whatever you're collaborating on. You have folders, and inside that you have files. Um, there are two types of spaces, paid and free. Uh, <coughs> the paid ones will keep uh, version history on them. Okay. So you get to a point where you want to manage members, and you click the manage members there, that's going to launch a pop-up to the um, Grouper UI, which is the uh, um, simple management interface for that one particular group. And so you customize this screen so it doesn't show anything about Grouper, like you don't know how to get back to the main part or anything. It just shows the name of this one specific group, normal users, and you can hide show you know, the folder structure. So I had to go to that advanced features to show the full path. And here I can just type in um, with this autocomplete one of the users that are already in Grouper and add them. Um, and since this one's a paid space, it supports external users. I can go to advanced features, invite external people. And here I can just put an email address of people I want to invite, and I can customize the message. And then down here, it's going to automatically provision them into this group once they've um, registered. So I send an email, <coughs> customize this message a little bit. <coughs> and I could add more groups, but normally users don't. That's an autocomplete. I should have just highlighted it. Normally users don't know what other groups to add them to, so they click Submit. Then an email goes out and it registers a UUID for that invitation. Um, you go to, I just switched to my email that it sent it to, and it says, this is for Secure Space. Click on this link. <coughs> so basically, um, I'll open that in a new browser I'm already logged in, come to the same Where You're From page. They're either going to have to pick an institution that they're um, a member of at in common, or we have an agreement with Protect Network, which is a cloud provider where they can uh, create a free account. And then they'd be able to use that Protect Network, Network account uh, for other applications that require an in common account. <coughs> so basically, let's assume they pick Protect Network. And hand waving where they create their own account, log in. <coughs> and <coughs> then they're going to go to the Grouper UI, <coughs> and you customize this page for the information that you want to collect from them. So we know that what their EPPN is, network. Just because they send an assertion of their name or email or whatever, we don't know. I mean, maybe they self-enter that at their institution. So really, we're, we're treating everything as user-entered data. So we're just going to let them enter it. <coughs> and now they're automatically a member of that. Uh, group and they could log into secure space and see that space there. So that's basically how we use Grouper external people at that. And now other applications that use external people could um, easily, more easily add that user. They don't have to do it by email address because now they're resolvable in the subject API and searchable as well. There's more details about that and you can, if you're interested, I can send you a link.
15 minutes. So this was the This is what we did with uh, CMU. So, naming best practices. <coughs> was that your suggestion or was that a Utah suggestion? Okay. My suggestions for naming. <coughs> At Penn, um, we have a top level folder that's called Penn. Chicago is <coughs> called UC. And that's generally to make your group names globally unique. They're not definitely going to be globally unique. You're not registering this top-level thing. Um, but it might be a good idea to have a top-level folder that has something to do with your institution. We also have a top-level folder called test, which obviously would not be globally unique, because I'm telling you to make one, too. Do I sound worse? Um, but basically, then you could use your production grouper deployment to run a test environment of an application. And you don't have to run a whole other grouper deployment to do that. So we have a dev grouper instance, a test grouper instance, and a prod one. But we don't keep the test instance up all the time. We just use it for upgrades and stuff like that. We don't want people's test environments for their applications to depend on our test environment of grouper. So we have this test folder where they can you know, create stuff. We don't want them to load tests there, obviously. but um, they could create, create groups there. <laughs> so generally, at Penn, our folder structure matches privilege delegation. That's why the, the second level folders underneath Penn are the schools and centers. And um, then we have the community folder, stuff like that. So this is basically our second level folder structure at Penn that I already went through. And then if you look at an application, I don't know if this is big enough to see. Sorry, I hate it when people do that. Um, so here we have pen colon isc colon ait colon apps colon pen community direct. That's an application that we have. You should keep some organization underneath there too. So don't put, you know, I mean, have folders that aren't necessarily created for um, privilege delegation, but you can just create them for general organization. So we have a folder called admin, a folder called permissions, a folder called roles, a folder called role groups, whatever it is, schemas, whatever else. So use folders to organize your, your stuff so it's easy to, um, to maintain. Chris, do you uh, suggest those kinds of guidelines to your departments where you delegate this out? Yeah, we have a grouper wiki and we have some best practices, but if they do it or not, you know, it's up to it's their stuff. And right. um, in the grouper properties, you can enforce which uh, characters are allowed for group names. Um, probably can't read this either from way back there, but group.attribute.validator.attribute name. Here I say it's a regex that can be lower or uppercase letters, numbers, underscore. And you have to put colon in there because this is for the full group name, not just the extension. And dot and dash. So if anyone creates a group that doesn't have that, they'll get an error that says uh, group ID or ID path invalid since it must contain only alphabetic underscore colon dot. Um, you got to think about what downstream systems you're going to have. And I would, I would clamp this down as much as you can at first because it's hard to clamp down later on if you um, put the PSP up with the downstream system that can't have parentheses or something or whatever it is. Um, so I generally start with extensions that are the same as display extensions. Some people like to have spaces and title case in their group extensions instead of camel case. Um, but you can do what you want there. And that's obviously something you can't really tell every user of Grouper to do. It's just something that I do. So do you, uh, but it seems like you use the same values for your display name as you do for your name. Well, you start out, I start out that way. And then if the group needed to be more descriptive or something, you can change the display and description without affecting anything. Right, the ID path stays the same. Um, but I, I find it's kind of helpful when people go to the UI and they see what the actual thing is as opposed to having to decrypt from the display one to the regular one. But you should do that anyway, because if you, I don't know. That's just how I start out. Maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. So some institutions have a high-level apps folder. That would be right underneath Penn or UC. And that's basically for the huge apps at the university. Um, you don't want to put them in the folder that you delegated to, like the IT department or the business services or whatever. Uh, we don't do this. 
Um, some institutions recommend it. It's nice if the app um, changes their governance from one place to another, then you don't have to move it in Grouper or delegate someone's folder structure to someone else. Um, so that's an idea you can think of. Um, High-level community folder for your loader jobs, I think, is a good idea. And um, descriptive extensions. There are some places in the UI and maybe other places where you only see the extension. If the extension was just called group, it'd be hard to know what it is without mousing over it if there's a tooltip or whatever. So instead of doing admins, I do like PTO admins if the application is PTO or whatever it is so that the extension of the group is a little bit more descriptive. Obviously, you don't want the, the extension to be the entire path, so you got to keep it short. But if there's a way to put something in there to make the extension you know, a little bit more descriptive, I think it's a good idea. And so this is, I just showed the community folder at Penn. We have a bunch of groups there. Uh, we have courses, and some of our course groups have includes, excludes, and um, we handle <coughs> cross-reference courses and stuff like that. Um, each course has a folder, and then inside there, we have all for everybody. We have assistants with, with includes, excludes. We have guests and instructors with includes, excludes. Students with includes, excludes, and by default, the instructors have um, read and update on the includes excludes lists and um, and maybe the assistance too, I don't remember. And so they can easily add or remove people that aren't officially enrolled that, that need access to whatever it is. And here, you know, it drills down by the term and the school and the course and the number and the section and so forth. So employee orgs are similar to courses. Um, you can, like I said before, organize that so that org namespace changes don't affect the group names and burns. Um, here's an example of that where you have um, employee org and then there's a folder for that org and then the org is inside there. Or if you, um, if the org, at Penn, the org is either a person org or a roll-up org. Um, if it's a roll-up org, that's in the same structure, Penn community employee org and then the org name um, and in this case, there's an includes excludes list on the rollups. For some reason, we needed that, but not the other one. Maybe we should add the other one, too. If someone asked for it, we can do it. Um, and that, um, that rollup org system of record only contains the orgs that are directly underneath it. And, um, and then the overall org would have composites based on the includes and excludes of that. So like, for instance, for some reason, our VP of our IT department is not in the IT org. Um, he's in the, uh, the, the executive something org. But he needs access to all our stuff, so we add him to the um, IT department overall includes list. Another example is there's a, someone with a dual appointment between the engineering school and the IT department, and for some reason they didn't show up in the org here, so we add them. Also. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just hoping they can, so like going back to your, your courses, for every one of your courses, you automatically uh, uh, generate those different groups? Yeah. And then what about your, what about the man, how do you decide who can actually then add stuff to the student includes, student excludes? That's the instructor, so that works. Because uh, that's my point, I mean, so is there another group that actually contains who's, who can actually do the, so permissions on I didn't put this in the press. I think it's a best practice to only assign privileges to groups of people, not individuals. So basically the privilege on those includes excludes lists for read and update are is that instructor group. So who's ever loaded in the okay. instructor group? Right. That and the instructors have includes excludes too. So who's ever in that overall instructor group, but they're gonna be able to that's a good idea. That's my point. So the yeah. instructor group is then the ones that has the permission of those exactly. other guys. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And are you doing all those includes excludes through the loader? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, the, I would imagine, maybe I'm wrong, but I would imagine like the excludes and includes would be the manual ones and the loader one would be the... Would the composites are all created and the privileges are all set by the loader. Right. And they're initially created with an empty includes excludes list and that list right. is never managed. And as people add the people to the includes excludes list, the loader doesn't touch them, but it makes sure they exist and that the composites are also there. Oh, I see. So, so someone manually goes and adds someone to an includes list, and the loader doesn't care. Right, that's the point. It's the system of record group that's going to be overwritten. So, I was looking at the configuration settings for the loader includes excludes, and I was wondering how you use those. And now, because composites, once they're created, you 
can't modify them without destroying them. Right. right. So is that the reason that you're, you're creating them with the loader? That well, they're, they're kind of a pain. They're kind of a pain to create. And we have a way to add an old style attribute. You just click include, exclude, or whatever, and it'll create the five groups for you. Right. Um, so basically, the loader just does that. If they don't exist, and if they already exist, yeah. Yeah, if it doesn't, if they exist, then it just leaves it. I mean, no data is going to be lost. Those includes, exclude groups will still be there, and there's a lot of people in there, but they won't be they won't be used in the calculation of the overall group anymore. So, so if you take off the include. Exclude. So can we talk like the assistance would be a composite of uh, in, includes and the assistance of record and then minus the excludes? So a composite can only have two factors. So in this case, there are two ways to do it. Either includes could override excludes or excludes could override includes. In this case, we have the excludes overriding the includes. So you have the system of record group right here. So like assistance, if we click on assistance, wouldn't that tell us the structure? Of, isn't the assistance the composite group? Yeah, but this is a screenshot. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can click on it and it'll go to the next slide. Oh, look, it's coming up. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you. I know how it works. I know how it works. System of record is a group from the system of record automatically loaded. Includes is a manual group. This group, system of record and includes, is a group that's not a composite, but it has includes as a member and system of records as a member. Okay? Because we don't like unions, right? Right. That's Remember right. that. <laughs> so then that group and excludes is minus, it's, it's the system of record and includes minus excludes is the overall. Group. Okay. And you can set all that up manually, or you can just click on include X. I don't think we're going to make it through all this. <laughs> what time do you? What, guys, what time can you stay? Are you interested? We leave. You want questions? We have four minutes. I'm going to try to tie it up at four thirty. All right. Five categories of loader, I think we've covered that. There's a lot of stuff on the wiki. Three types of composites. Union never used this. Already <laughs> covered that. Uh, you can set it up manually, you can do it with a loader, you can do it with group attributes. Um, so include X who can delegate privilege as well. We already talked about why. System of record is what's used as a, um, uh, prior to the composite. And again, composite groups do not actually remove something from the system of record. It's just out of the overall group. So if you get added back to the system of record and whatever the composite calculation is, it'll work again. Rules, however, are things that happen in grouper and it runs an expression language or some other sort of action. And that will actually remove users from a group. So those are useful. If you want users to be permanently removed, if they're hired somewhere else in the institution, um, they have to go through the same intake process. Um, we use... Like triggers? What's that? They're like triggers? Yeah. Then uses permissions in several apps. An interesting one is uh, we want to manage IT people's permissions of apps to be able to restart the app server or Apache or view the logs or redeploy. So basically we have um, users with a role and the permissions are the application. The actions are what you can do, Tomcat restart, Apache graceful, whatever. Um, we cache all that in the operating system, and then we have real-time and batch provisioning. So you can look, if you Google pen Unix permissions or whatever, a grouper, um, there's a whole document about this. But basically, um, we have XMVP messages that come out of the grouper change log, and it's going to manage a properties file on the Unix server. So if grouper's ever down, people can still go and restart servers, because how would you restart grouper if it can't connect to grouper and so forth? Um, and so that works well. It's not quite live, um, but there are four levels of inheritance with permissions. You can have a group that's inside of another group. So you can have a group of, uh, of um, people that can manage um, student-based applications. Role inheritance is you get all the permissions that another role has. So you could have a senior administrator role that has all the admin role has, but um, tack on some more permissions. Action inheritance, you can make a Tomcat all action that um, includes Tomcat status, restart, stop, and start, so you don't have to assign all those actions. You can just do the overall action, and it'll be effective. It'll effectively assign everything. So you could have like a cluster all action that includes all everything, and that might be what the admin of the app has. Permission inheritance, you could have your applications have inheritance so that research applications include all of the five permissions for all those five research applications. 
So basically, what these inheritance, um, uh, what the what the inheritance means in permissions is you have fewer assignments and fewer mistakes, um, fewer unassignments when you're um, taking people out of things. Um, Utah asks about how to go from basic to production. This is the one thing I wanted to cover today, and now we don't have time. I will uh, I will act like a uh, <coughs> auctioneer and try to get through it. Start with the installer. Do manual builds based on the installer output. Um, tweak some config config settings, see it work. Um, do a subject source, see if your SQL or LDAP. You might have more flexibility with JDBC because you can have a data feed and massage it. If everything you need is in JNDI or LDAP and it's highly available, use that. We already talked about availability of, of subject sources. Um, subjects should really be always resolvable even when they're not um, active anymore. There's a big thread on the list recently about that. ID, opaque, unchanging identifier. We talked about net ID, EPPN. Description is generally what's shown on the screen, but you can configure that. So at Penn, we have a SQL source, and we want it to be pretty descriptive so you're assigning the right people. So for instance, we have name, net ID, comma, um, a subject identifier, whether they're active or not. If it's a staff member, we say it's staff. If it's student, we say what school they're in or whatever. Title, and then also what other affiliations they have. Um, so you can customize the UI. You can put a logo on, on the top left from the media properties. Um, you can do UI authentication. It's easy to do shiv, cas, cosine, whatever else. Um, if it has a web server plugin with a remote user, that's easy. Or you can do a servlet filter with whatever your authentication is uh, for SSO. So then look at some of your config files, see which settings you want to change. Feel free to leave. It's fine. Um, change those settings. See what you want in production. Uh, do some LDAP provisioning with AD, PSP, batch, real time, whatever. Um, document everything that you do for your group or deployment for your users. Maybe have a wiki with some of the best practices or things you've decided. Um, delegate privileges for high level folders as needed. We just created a couple for the apps that were going in and then as more people wanted access, we'd give it to them. Train um, the admins of Grouper, train the people you're delegating privileges to, show them the training videos and stuff, integrate projects. Um, decide which environments you want to have. If you want to do dev test prod, maybe there's a training environment. I don't know. See which config settings are different for each environment. Um, keep your uh, config files in your own revision control, so you keep track of them. And then have a build script that, that wars them up. So Penn contributed something that has an end script for this, where we have this in our own CVS at Penn. Yes, we still use CVS, sorry. Uh, with Eclipse. Um, using it for so long, it's hard to migrate off. So basically, we have things that change for each environment. We have variables in the config files. And then in our um, build.properties, we have things that, um, you know, this is going to change in the group or hibernate properties for each environment. And then these are the various things for each environment. And Ant will go and create three more files for dev test prod that, that is the same for most of the things, but whatever's a variable, it changes. So it's kind of useful. But you can take that strategy with, you know, Maven or Subversion or Git or these newfangled technologies, whatever they are, and probably do the same thing. Done. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Questions besides can I leave now? Nice sprint. <laughs> yeah. Um, so PSP, you guys say you're, you're, you rolled your own, so you don't use PSP. Yeah. Um, have you done any testing with uh, PSP yeah. recently? No, we have it working and we're happy and most people don't want to spend time on it and I call them those people. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they have Perl scripts that get stuff real time and batch to RLDAP and they, they're happy and, you know, You guys haven't run any, any load call or anything from the number of groups? So is the intention of PSP to be able to provision to many high target systems? Yeah. In different ways? Right. We have a project to go to Active Directory, and with that, in the project pitch, we said we would use the PSP. Um, 